And uh, so, shall we start? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Dr. Lota Pokamo uh, from Geological Survey of Finland. Uh, Lota is the geomicrobiologist. <laughs> uh, she got her uh, both PhD and a master degree from the University of uh, Helsinki, uh, both in the major of applied microbiology. Uh, her research interests include microbioecology, uh, functionality, and uh, metabolic uh, properties of microbes in natural environments. Uh, and also the role of a microbes in global carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur cycles. Um, her, her current uh, research in, investigates the links between a bio, a biotic and a biotic carbon cycling in deep terrestrial uh, biosphere. But today, her topic is more modern. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, Groundwater Flow Impacts the Microbial uh, Communities and biogeochemistry in Baltic Sea port marks. Okay, uh, time is yours, Lauda. Thank you very much. And thank you for your nice uh, presentation or, or invitation, first of all, for, the, for me to come over and, and talk about the research that I, I, I've done in the past couple of years. So yes, the, the title of the of the talk is out there. I'm going to talk about the microbial communities and biogeochemistry in, um, in the Baltic Sea, in these pockmarks, which have uh, groundwater uh, input in them. And probably this group is very familiar with the submarine groundwater discharge. So SGD, I'm going to be talking a lot about SGD in this talk. So that's the abbreviation. Um, so SGD is the flow of ground groundwater from coastal aquifers to the sea, where material is transported between land and sea. And it's, um, it's assumed that the SGD is probably something like 1% of the, of the riverine discharge globally. And even though it's a rather small percentage compared to the riverine discharge, it may still have significant impact on coastal ecosystems and the water quality on local and regional scales. And sometimes this SGD leads to the development of local depressions called pockmarks in the seabed or in the seafloor. The SGD influences uh, physical and chemical gradients in these pockmarks, so in the seabed. And these different gradients mean distinctive biogeochemical environments. And we only know fairly small amount of the microbial ecology of SGD. And especially from the Baltic Sea, there's only in I think there's only like one study prior to ours where the microbial ecology of, of this uh, SGD. Luta. Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, your slide is still on the first, uh, oh on dear. The first slides. Oh dear. <laughs> they are not changing at all. What is happening? Maybe you can uh, resharing. Um, I'm sharing again. Yeah, stop it and just share it again. Try that. Yeah, yeah, it works now. It works now. Okay. Does it change? Yeah. Uh, we turn to another. Yeah, yeah, it's changing. Okay. I'll, I'll try. I'll try a little. Yeah, we have to get it. Is it working? Okay. Do you see now the SGD induces heterogeneity? Yeah. Slide. Yeah. Okay, good. Let me know if it doesn't change. I'll try to do something about it. 
So yeah, SGD influences the physical and chemical gradients, and these mean that we get different biogeochemical environments, and we only know a little bit about the microbial ecology of SGD, and especially from the Baltic Sea, there's only basically only one study, I think, prior to our study on the microbial ecology of pockmarks uh, produced by SGD. Uh, our hypothesis was what to see whether these differing environments in pockmarks host specific microbial communities and do these have a specific metabolisms. So basically who is there, what are, what are, what are they doing, and how does the SGD affect the microbial community, community composition and the functionality of the microbes. Now I changed the slide. Is, is it changing? Yeah, it's working. Good, good, good. Okay. So the, today's talk is mainly based on this paper that came out last summer in GCA, Impact of Submarine Groundwater Discharge on Biogeochemistry and Microbial Communities in Pockmarks. Uh, but I will also be referring to some of other, like, um, previous papers for example in solid earth there was there's this paper by Jonas Virtasala et al uh, that describes the site more specifically and then there's this uh, geological and groundwater flow model of the site the same site in hydrogeology's journal written by Samrit Luoma and also, if you are interested in, in behavior of a uh, couple of specific isotopes in this, in this environment on, or in this realm, uh, you should check out this applied geochemistry paper also came last year, came out last year by Juuso Ikkonen. Okay, the Hanko SGD site is basically in the southern tip of Finland, which you can see here. I'm not sure if you can see my, my cursor, hopefully you can, but it's right there in the, in the southern end of Finland. Um, it's in the, or influenced by the first Salpausselkä uh, ice margin formation. And there's a lot of gravel, sand, uh, in the area, and you can see that as well on the on the picture there. And there's going to be a couple of more pictures. So this is taken from the uh, from the uh, RB vessel uh, Geomari. And the site has been characterized uh, on 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 the land with GPR, so ground penetration penetrating radar survey, and there's also seismic survey done in the, on the offshore, basically. So the, green, uh, the blue lines in the, in the figure. And, and in this picture, you can see a little bit more how it looks like in the nature. So there's some uh, vegetation like the pine trees and some shrubbery and very sandy as you can see it's a nice sandy beach we don't have those a lot in Finland but this is a very nice sandy beach and in here you have you can see the 3D groundwater flow model that has been built from that area and uh, the red lines are marking the flow path of the of the groundwater and these HP 101 and HP 102 are groundwater wells that have been drilled from uh, from the top to the bottom of the of the well not to the bottom but to the bottom layer basically of the of the formation and um, with the stars there's these three stars that mark the pock marks that had have been studied in this study. And the HP101 is also uh, sampled in, in, in our study. So the groundwater well is this HP101.
And these are the multi-beam bathymetric images from the site. Uh, the B, D, and E in the first figure mark the pockmarks. So these will be continued. I will be continuously mentioning these B, D, and E pockmarks in the talk. There's also the HP 101, which was the groundwater well. It's like 400 meters from here. Uh, and then there's this IV, which is um, obsolete um, water intake well, uh, which we also sampled in, in the study. And then the, this J means the control sample site for the, for the seawater. And here's the B, D, and E again. Uh, you can see that these are definitely like those. Um, there is this drop in the in, on the sea floor and like a hole in the sea floor. And in the second figure here, you can see that the they are a couple of meters deep, and they can reach a uh, distance or the or the diameter of like. 30 meters even, like from here is the pockmark B and the, and the profile of, of, of the pockmark B here. And we sampled uh, 2019, if I remember correctly, <laughs> um, on board the research vessel Geomari and then also on shore. We took sediment samples from these pockmarks B, D, and E. So two depths of each sediment sample, uh, 1.5 to 2.5 centimeters and 3.5 to 4.5 centimeters depth for the microbiology. And then we took these one centimeter intervals for the multi-element composition analysis. We also took seawater two meters below the sea surface, midwater, so six meters below the sea surface and the bottom water, which was one meter above the pock mark. And then we also took the surface seawater reference sample, which I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, that was on the uh, J site. Then we went to went, went onshore and took groundwater samples from an observation well and an obsolete water intake well, which was just located on shore. So the observation well, uh, groundwater well was a little bit further from the shore and then the obsolete water intake well is right there, situated, situated very close to the, close to the uh, water line. And in addition, we took some sediment pore water samples for the geochemistry, but not for the microbiology. Mm, the water geochemistry, we, we did this multi-element composition uh, uh, analysis for seawater, groundwater, pore water samples. These were like all of these, which are listed in this slide, were, were analyzed. And then we also analyzed chloride concentration with iron chromatography. Uh, methane concentrations were measured, delta 13C dissolved in organic carbon with isotope ratio monitoring mass spec, and ammonium concentrations were measured. And in this figure, you can see the setup of the pore water sampling. So we had these, we had these syringes and tubes put to the lump of the sediment. And uh, that's how the pore water samples were basically retrieved. And the sediment geochemistry, we measured the cesium activity content to evaluate the sedimentation rates. And then the sediment was sieved, digested, and um, the concentrations of, of a lot of elements were measured from the sediment. And the grain size distribution was also, also measured. 
from the sediment. And then the biomass collection and DNA extraction was done for both water samples and then the sediment samples. So water samples were uh, retrieved one like 1.5 liters of groundwater because we assume that the groundwater will not have as much biomass as the seawater. That's why different amounts of, of these different water samples. Uh, these were filtered through 0.2 micrometer filters. Uh, the filter was uh, cut from the funnel and cut to smaller pieces and put to this um, uh, extraction tube, which was provided in the commercial kit, kit for water samples, and the DNA was extracted as, as the manufacturer uh, advised. Similarly, the sediment samples, which were first in these larger tubes, 250 milligrams of each sediment sample was weighed to an extraction kit tube and DNA was extracted from the sediment using this uh, commercial kit for soil and sediment samples. And then when we had the DNA in our hands, we quantified the extracted DNA uh, using this qubit four meter measuring device. And then we ended up doing sequencing and bioinformatics. So when we have the DNA, we can then use this uh, 16S rRNA gene, which is a phylogenetic marker gene for uh, different organisms. Uh, both bacteria and archaea can be targeted with this 16S rRNA gene and a little bit different region of the gene, but really doesn't make it a, a, lot of, a lot of difference, which region is, is like between different bacteria or ar archaea. And uh, we used Illumina platform and paired and read protocol so we could sequence from both ends of the, of the specific, specific region. And then when we got the sequences, we did the quality control, uh, removed the chimeras and classified the sequences in MOTOR, which is a bioinformatics tool used in, in this amplicon sequencing a lot. And then we also uh, calculated or analyzed the ecological indices for diversity, abundance, richness, evenness, and coverage. Uh, so Shannon, uh, CHA1, ACE, so abundance-based uh, coverage, coverage estimate and all, all these sort of ecological alpha diversity indices for the sequences. And with the DNA, we could also uh, estimate the number of bacteria, the number of archaea, and the number of specific metabolic populations in the samples. Um, again, using the 16S rRNA gene, uh, we could estimate the number of bacteria using the bacterial 16S rRNA and measuring the copies with the quantitative PCR methodology, similarly with archaea. Again, the 16S rRNA gene copies and the metabolic uh, or the functions that we quantitated were nitrate reduction, ammonia oxidation, methanotrophy, methanogenesis, and sulfate reduction. And all of these have um, specific functional genes that can be used to quantify uh, the population, the amount of, of uh, copies of these specific functional genes in, uh, in environmental DNA. Then we also did reactive transport modeling. And this is very much out of my comfort zone. So don't ask a lot of questions about this. You can see details in the paper. 
but it was mainly to understand the diagenetic and burial processes from a mechanist mechanistic perspective. And there's a, a long list of different uh, metabolic reactions that, that was taken into consideration. And then the simulation or the model was run for 50 year period. And then we could see, see how, or we could, basically make make a model out of the out of out of the the movement of of different um, or the processes that were happening in the SGD sites or the POC marks. Okay, now we get to the results and don't be scared of this uh, very busy slide. I'm going to break it down to you a little bit. And let's first concentrate on the on the axis of these different plots. So we have pockmark B, pockmark D, and pockmark E again. Pockmark B and D were sampled with this um, box corer. So the core depth is only in pockmark B five centimeters and in pockmark D set ten centimeters. While pockmark E could be sampled with this. Uh, more like a drill core type of thing or corer. And we got um, more than 50 centimeters of the uh, length of the core or the like the sediment sediment of the of the pockmark E. And this is like all of the samples came from the same uh, sediment samples. So all of these uh, are similar in other, other characteristics uh, the years that I are, are upcoming in the in the talk. And if we see, if we look at the chloride concentrations, we can see that the uh, pockmark E immediately that it's saline. So the uh, um, concentration of the chloride is up here in the hundred millimoles, millimoles per liter all the way down to the core, while in pockmark B, it will, it goes a little bit uh, or starts from the little bit lower concentration and goes down, down quite a bit. And then in pockmark D, there's basically not very much chloride. And that's why it's sort of like we can, we can sort of distinguish these three that um, Pokemark East has saline, typical brackish Baltic Sea type of, of water, while Pokemark B is sort of like intermediate between E and D, and D is totally fresh water. Uh, similar with the total sulfur concentration. So uh, in Pokemark B and D, sulfur sort of like acts as similarly with the chloride, but in pockmark E, we get high concentrations of uh, total sulfur. And then gradually when we go down in depth, uh, the sulfur concentrations uh, get close to zero. And then if we look at the dissolved inorganic carbon and the delta 13C of, of DIC, uh, methane concentrations and, and ammonia concentrations. Pockmark D is, um, so you have to again look at the, the axis here. So Pockmark B and D have the same kind of axis in this, in this figure. And um, the most negative values for the delta 13C and also the lowest concentrations for DIC, uh, methane, and uh, ammonia are in the pockmark D. Again, the pockmark B is the intermediate between pockmark E and D. And Pockmark E has really orders of magnitude higher DIC, ammonium, and 
especially uh, methane concentrations. Um, and the delta 13C in this pockmark E is only slightly negative on the sediment surface, but then uh, drops uh, a little bit towards the negative side at six centimeters, but then reaches again up to 10, uh, up to 10 uh, MUR values after the 25 centimeters. So as a sum of all of these geochemistry results, Pockmark D definitely seems to have active groundwater discharge, while Pockmark B has some kind of, uh, or has active discharge, but it's not as strongly influent, it's not as strong influence as in D, in Pockmark D, and Pockmark E is, uh, a sample uh, of a pockmark that where the groundwater discharge discharge has ceased, and the accumulation of sediment has has started, and it sort of re resembles the normal kind of sea sea floor uh, in relation to at least to the accumulation of the of the sediment. Again, a busy slide, but I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, this is the microbial communities or the bacterial communities that we discovered from the, from the pockmarks and seawater and groundwater. And in every column, we have different class of, of ba different bacterial class. And then on rows, we have different pockmarks. So D, B and E the very active one, the moderately active, and then the inactive pockmark or the SGD. And then we have the seawater, which we have first two controls from the, like further away from the site, and then seawater uh, one meter above the pockmarks, B, D, and E, and then the two groundwater sites that were sampled or the wells that were sampled. So one A and B, uh, sorry, uh, one and two. So A and B is always the, the uh, parallel samples. And then the relative abundance is on the x-axis, but uh, bear in mind that these are, are all different between the different columns. So these are, not, you cannot really compare these between each other, only like in the column. And what we see in, uh, from the bacterial community is that the groundwater definitely has some influence on the alpha proteobacterial class. Uh, it's fairly abundant in the groundwater samples and abundant in B, a little bit less abundant in B, and even less abundant in E. So there's a, like a gradual um, change from relatively abundant to not as abundant from the active to the inactive uh, pockmark. Similarly, we can see that there are a couple of classes like Nitrospiria, for example, here, that are probably derived from the groundwater because they are not really abundant or not even visible in this plot, at least in the seawater, and then very uh, abundant in the pockmark D and not so abundant in other, other two pockmarks. And then kind of a, a typical sediment, um, class of bacteria is are these two. So there's the sulfobacteria and the sulfobulbia. And you can probably guess from the names of these classes that these are uh, sulfate reducers. So SRB, sulfate reducing bacteria. And very abundant in the pockmark E, where there's a lot of sediment, and relatively abundant in pockmark B, 
and uh, you can probably see a hint of these in the bookmark D, which was the most active one, and not really uh, seen or observed in seawater or in groundwater. The archaeal population, on the other hand, uh, had this uh, unclassified archaea, and that's not very uh, untypical. Uh, usually archaea are not as well known, uh, are uh, as well um, represented in the, in the, in these uh, data banks where we sort of uh, compare our sequences with. So a lot of archaea come up as classic unclassified. So we, we really don't know uh, much about the archaea or, or, or all of the archaea that are in the environment. So it's not that. Uh, so it's fairly typical, actually, to have unclassified archaea. And uh, the largest group in, in, in this study in the archaeal population was that we really couldn't cl classify these archaea into any specific class or family or genus. And uh, this unclassified bacteria, uh, unclassified archaea, sorry, uh, were most likely coming from the groundwater because they weren't really seen in the seawater. Uh, similarly, this Bathyarchioda was a little bit uh, interesting as well, because this was fairly abundant in the groundwater sample that we uh, managed to get DNA out of with the archaeal analysis. And it was most typical in this pockmark B, but not really seen in pockmark D. And uh, not as abundant in Pokemark E as in Pokemark B. So that was a little bit uh, unexpected result. And then we also have this Nitrosferia class of archaea, which is very typical seawater archaeum or archaeal class. And they were also abundant in the, in the groundwater. But you can see that they're like almost all of the archaea that were in the seawater. So this is like 100% basically relative abundance here were not nitrososphere or belong, belong to the nitrososphere class. An interesting population of, of uh, archaea are methanogens. So these are archaea that produce methane. And these were very abundant in the Pokemark E, where there's a lot of organic matter and, uh, um, and basically sediment, and almost uh, not observed at all in Pokemark D, and very low abundance in Pokemark B as, as well. And this is a NMDS pot made, made from the archaea and bacterial sequences or the, well, yes, the sequences or the OTUs that were produced from the sequences. And we can see that the, the seawater communities group together the groundwater community and the pockmark D sediment communities are sort of in this one. Uh, one part of the of the polot, and then the pockmark B and pockmark E sediments are on the other other side of the plot, which is sort of like the sediment, groundwater, and seawater. Uh, sorry, groundwater, seawater, and sediment. Uh, <laughs> sediment, seawater, and groundwater uh, circle these different groups here and it's the same with the archaea and bacteria so all of these all of these group quite nicely together in the NMDS. and if we look at the microbial metabolism so the quantitative pcr results um, the sulfate reducers were, were 
were very abundant in all all these three different pockmarks. So in B and D, uh, they were up to 7% of the total community. And the nitrogen cycling potential was especially high in pockmark B. And then uh, uh, from, the, from the bacterial uh, community analysis, we also uh, observed nitrospirus, which are known uh, complete ammonium oxidizers. So they oxidize ammonium all the way to nitride. And the, these were also detected in pockmark D. And the lowest numbers of methanogens was in the pockmark D again. And coming to the conclusions, the SGD rates calculated from the poor water chloride profiles uh, show strong groundwater influence for pockmark B and especially D. Uh, groundwater advection sort of pushes the reactants into a very narrow zone near the sediment surface. And that's why the microbial activity is high on the top part of the sediment column. And the advection further reduces the accumulation of organic matter in surface sediments, resulting in the absence of sulfate methane transition zone in these pockmarks. And the lack of SGD in pockmark E permits rapid deposition of organic matter. And that's why the pockmark E has orders of magnitude higher concentrations of, for example, methane and sulfine organic carbon. And if we think about the microbial communities, pockmark E has a, a typical uh, microbial community for muddy sediments in the Baltic Sea, coastal Baltic Sea. For example, there is a study from uh, Boyo Bay, which had very similar microbial or the bacterial community, especially, uh, which is in the coastal area of the Baltic Sea in, in Finland. And then Pockmark B and D microbial communities have some similarities with other SGD sites. Uh, one that is in, uh, I think it's in po Polish or, or German uh, coast. Polish, I think it's Polish coast uh, in the Baltic Sea. And then the pockmark sediments host more diverse microbial communities compared to the groundwater and compared to seawater. And the active pockmarks have uh, overall micro, uh, higher overall microbial density, as well as higher functional team copy numbers in the near surface sediment, while the inactive pockmark has higher copy numbers of all measured genes in the sediment. So the microbial diversity hotspot is in the interface or the, or the mixing zone of the, of the groundwater and the seawater. And one uh, interesting thing was the nitrogen, nitrogen cycling in the active pockmarks. So we have ammonia oxidizing archaea, such as Candidatus nitrosotalea, which is abundant in both pockmark D sediment and in groundwater. And then we have nitrosarchaeum in groundwater and both active pockmarks that are converting ammonia to nitrite. And then we have this uh, nitrifying or even uh, comamox complete ammonia oxidizer, uh, nitrospira in pockmark D, oxidizing nitrate to uh, nit nitrite to nitrate, or even, yeah, or even ammonium to nitrate. So the efficient nitrogen cycling cycle is very important to ecosystems with low uh, amount of substrate or like which suffer from substrate limitation. And there's also an uh, effect of, uh, or we can see an effect of uh, sal salinity to the ammonia oxidizing community 
So the bacterial dominance of the ammonia oxidizing community declines with decreasing salinity. And this was observed in our study as well as uh, one previous study in um, sea environment. Uh, the focused SGD changes the local seafloor microbial community composition. It might activate the rare biosphere or inactivate other members of the community. But with the pockmark E turning into a kind of a typical, uh, resembling more of the typical um, seafloor microbial community, we can sort of think that if the SGD is inactivated, then some part of the community is, is resistant and will bounce back. So the microbial community will alter again to resemble more of the typical seafloor community. I have a cheeky advert. So please come, come to Banff in October. Uh, we have a second uh, joint symposium of environmental bio biogeochemistry and subsurface microbiology there. Uh, have a look more info in the, in the in the web page. And finally, I would like to thank my collaborators, funders, uh, GTK, for allowing me to write this paper and helping out with the paper with all of the co-authors and um, the funding came from uh, bonus project, bonus Seamount and bonus, and also Baltic Transcoast, Academy of Finland, and the AAD gave us some money to do this stuff. That's all for me. I'm glad to, if you can ask any, if you want to ask any questions, I'm not sure if I can answer all, all of the questions, but please do, please do ask. You have something. Let's talk a lot. Too. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, no, any questions from the audience? You can just unmute yourself and talk. Hi, Bill. Hi. I've got a couple of questions. Um, Go ahead. I'm interested about the uh, the origin of the pot marks. Is it is the thinking that SGD actually created these features, or is it that the pot marks just make a convenient exit point for groundwater discharge? That's actually a really good, good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a geologist, but there is mm -hmm. this like a, a last ice age formation definitely that plays a big role in this area. And because it's sort of like loose, sandy material, I think it can be either or. I think the SGD might just like find out nice place to come up from the seafloor and sort of shows that yeah. the, the, the groundwater is definitely like the pathways are leading to the pock marks in the model. Mm -hmm. um, but which came first? Was it the egg or the chicken? It's, I, don't, I don't really know. Has there been any attempts to quantify the SGD? Um, I think there is something of that sort in the other papers okay. that my co co uh, collaborators and the, my colleagues in, in geological survey has, have published. Yeah. So maybe like you, maybe in the modeling right. modeling paper there is is a like it looks like you've done an incredible amount of work. You've not some... only me, I'm, I was just responsible of the microbiology, but I, I think this was hmm. this was really a nice collaborative yeah. and multidisciplinary work that we did here. So because we had yeah, like please. geochemists and microbiologists and and uh, geologists and modelers working together. I think this was very fun article to write and, and very yeah. fine, fun study to actually do. Um, one other thought, I, I remember reading and also hearing at a conference I went to several years ago 
that Finland has some of the highest uh, groundwater radon in the world. And radon is a very good uh, SGD tracer. So I'm yes. just wondering if uh, someone is taking advantage of the very high radon in the groundwater to study SGD and in the Finland. radon was definitely measured from these as well in 2000, uh, 2018. Uh -huh. I think it's in, in Jonas Virtasalo's paper uh, where, where it's published, but it was definitely like, like one of the first clues that, okay, there's definitely groundwater coming yeah. up. Yeah. And, and like radon is also almost like an issue for, for some places in Finland because there's so much of, of radon. I think it's so high in parts of Finland that they're concerned about human health. About yes, yes. Care. Some of the some of the houses have, have to have this kind of like radon blockage because of the yeah radon coming from the from the uh, bedrock. So it's yeah, it's definitely well, an issue you, in thank some point. Thank you very much for your talk. Yes, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Actually, before the talk, I, uh, I talked with a lot uh, about uh, using iridium and iridized tracers to quantify uh -huh. SPD fluxes. Okay. okay. Yeah. We're hanging up on them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any, any other questions? Lota, when you see the, uh, the... Okay, Dine, go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, interesting talk. Um, I have one question related to your graph that is um, the relative proportion of each classes in um, groundwater, seawater, and the pockmarks. Yep. So um, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, for example, for one of the class, you said that um, I think it's maybe the alpha proteobacteria. Yes. Um, you say that um, their, their occurrence in the pockmarks comes from groundwater because they are not really abundant in seawater. But they, so, are, they are like they are more abundant actually in seawater than in the like pockmark E, for example. But like, uh, um, yeah, it's it's from at least from this figure you cannot really really say that but uh, right so yes. um yeah so i think the question is like like do you have any specific um like um you know taxa that uh that shows the the connectivity between groundwater proc and and the pock marks there were there were definitely some like more so these are only like classes and we went mm -hmm. all all the way to the g genus level and there were right. some of some of so like some families and i can't remember which one those were even though i wrote <laughs> wrote the paper but there were some i think there was maybe burkholderia which was one of these um one of these and Maybe maybe there were some others, but we definitely looked into more into more detail to like from the class level to the more deeper level of the of the of the like taxonomy. So, but I can't I can't recall now. Obvious of of course. Then we can we can look at the paper. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah, just just curious because I think recently I read some papers that shows that in a beach, like in the sandy beach, um sometimes there is a little connectivity in like microbial wise between the taxa that they found in groundwater and then you know in the groundwater seawater interface. Yes. And yeah, so I'm just curious whether you find this some um, like indicator taxa that you can find yeah, yeah. both in groundwater and the uh, and the bookmarks. I can't recall now, but I definitely mm -hmm. see what you mean. And then, like I've looked into, uh, like if we could 
sort of say where the groundwater comes from in places where like deeper and shallower groundwaters are mixing and we right. can definitely say mm -hmm. like some of some um, taxa or or like uh, families that are very common in uh, like typically common in in bedrock related groundwater and then we can see those in the groundwaters that are uh, mixed with the with the more shallower like, soil groundwater so uh, there are definitely there are definitely those kind of microbes that are can be used as a as a marker for for more right. deep more deeper groundwater but this like this mm -hmm. study i can't recall what i wrote to the paper but then uh, uh, there is definitely these are all like soil groundwater so there's not not much of a of a bed like a deeper bedrock groundwater if I have, if I remember correctly, I don't think, I think it's just like the, because it's sort of like the uh, ice margin formation there, which is very, very typical for the, like a shallower groundwater aquifer type. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll, 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 I will read your, your paper after this. <laughs> good, sure. good. I read your <laughs> papers while doing this. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right, uh, Lota, we see the uh, pork market is influenced by groundwater, and it has indeed it has some characteristic uh, species. Do you think it's because of the groundwater uh, directly take the um, uh, the uh, species from the end member to the pork market, or because of the water changes the environment of the pork market? And some local species are just changed. That's yeah. That's, that's again really good question. I don't, I don't think there's like a specific answer to that. I sort of think that it might be that there is like a specific community in the groundwater that is then flowing because the water is flowing. So it's sort of like the water will bring the microbes to the pockmark and then to the sea. But then uh, if this question would have been asked in kind of a, maybe in like a, another kind of environment, uh, I would say that the microbial community is always related to the, like the biogeochemical environment that prevails in, in a specific system. So, the microbial community is always reflecting the, the sort of like the chemistry and the, uh, like uh, basically the whole envi the environment where they where they live on. So these uh, these results are based on the DNA or RNA. DNA. These are these are based on DNA. So the sort of the potential of the okay. microbes. So not really the active active proportion of the of the microbial community okay thank you um i don't think there's any more questions from the audience so i'd like to thank you again for the wonderful talk and um, thank you that is all for tonight and i wish you have a wonderful day yes. hopefully see you sometimes so, uh, somewhere somewhere yes. Yes. In person. I'm coming to EGU to talk about this stuff as well <laughs> in <Nice>. April. <laughs> okay. Good. All right, Lotta. Thank I'll you. See you. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. <clears throat> Hi, Bill. So long. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. It looks good. Bye-bye, Bill.